Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Relipsa. Hello, I'm Ileana Pina, Professor of Medicine at Wayne State and at Central Michigan University in Michigan. And this is a program called Guideline Directed Therapy for heart failure, challenges and solutions. It's actually getting very interesting in taking care of the heart failure patients. And I am thrilled today to have with me my friend Javed Butler, who's the Patrick Lehan Chair in Cardiovascular Research and the Professor of Medicine and Physiology at the University of Mississippi. And my good friend, Catherine DiPaolo, Clinical Program Manager from Hospital Readmissions Reduction Program at Montefiore Medical Center in New York. I want to welcome both of you to joining us today and appreciate your being here. So Thank you. Goals, Great to be here. Oh, my pleasure. The goals today are, first of all, to again reassess the guideline-based recommendations for the clinical management of heart failure, to discuss special considerations related to RASI use in patients with heart failure, and to present solutions to overcome the common challenges related to RASI enablement in patients with heart failure. So we know uh, the epidemiology of hyperkalemia. We know that we really want to medicate the patients and that often that's a stumbling block. Uh, and it's a stumbling block that we'd like to get over. Um, and yet at the same time, we often respond to, respond to hypokalemia and nobody bats an eye. We have to get potassium, we get potassium. And yet when we get to those higher levels, everybody gets worried and pulls back. So Jabed, just review for us the guideline recommendations for treating patients with heart failure. And we are referring primarily to HEFREF. Some days, one of these days, we'll be able to talk about HEFPEF, but sticking with HEFREF. Yeah, so you know, if you look at the guidelines, I mean, there are certain things for which there is no controversy. So if you look at global guidelines, you know, people can sort of argue in the minutiae and sort of on the, on, the, on the edges. But if you look at the core guidelines, whether you're looking at US guidelines, whether you're looking at any institution within the US, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, Heart Failure Society of America, you look at European guidelines, Australian guidelines, Chinese, Indian, whatever, there's a global consensus that there are certain medications that have certainly been shown to improve outcomes of patients with heart failure and reduce ejection fraction, which is, uh, RAS inhibition of some form, preferably angiotensin receptor nephrolysin inhibitors uh, or ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blockers if there's some other reason, uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists and beta blockers. These are really the foundational therapy for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And then you sort of also mentioned that have PEF and we don't necessarily have a, a, a definite uh, uh, guideline-based uh, therapy for those people, but also remember that these are the patients uh, with have PEF who have hypertension, perhaps resistant hypertension, diabetes, and these are the very same drugs, ischemic heart disease, that are being used in those patients as well. Uh, and at least at a class two level, unlike HEF-REF, but there's class one indication for all of these therapies and HEF-REF, uh, there is already a class two indication for MRA and for uh, angiotensin receptor block of candesartan as well. So all across the board, uh, in some way, shape, or form, the use of RAS inhibitors, MRAs, is really critical for the management of these patients. And I think, as you mentioned, uh, as an antihypertensive, and maybe I should back up my own statement about mineral corticoid receptor antagonists are being used for HEFF. And again, we have the same issues with hyperkalemia for those of us who believe the top cat uh, sub-study results. And so we think of these drugs as they're antihypertensives, but they're cardioprotective and renoprotective. And I think that that renoprotective aspect is the one that our clinicians often miss. 
and the fact that we know that, that it's going to go up. Tell me a little bit about what you think about doses. We have trials. If you, you look at these meta-analyses, it usually shows that the higher the doses, the better the patients do. How can you back that up? Well, so, you know, uh, I, I wish we had more dose uh, ranging studies per se. Uh, so there are some uh, drugs like ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers we, where we actually have dose ranging studies. Uh, ATLAS trial and HEAL trial using low doses versus high doses in a randomized fashion, not, not observational studies, randomized fashion, looking at ACE inhibitors, uh, 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 Losartan, uh, ARB as well, and uh, 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 ACE inhibitors. So, well, lisinopril. So what we learned in those studies uh, is that higher dose are certainly better than lower dose. There is about a 10 to 15 percent further improvement in the combined endpoint of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. A lot of it is carried by heart failure hospitalization uh, per se. So I think the first lesson is that, A, uh, as a research community, I wish we would do more randomized controlled trials. We don't have such data for uh, MRAs or for beta blockers. We certainly do know uh, from smaller studies and beta blockers uh, that higher dose certainly have more benefit than lower dose. Uh, we certainly have observational studies, uh, though they are a little bit confounded that higher doses are better. And at least for ACEs and HARPs, we have randomized controlled trial data uh, to say that higher doses are better than lower doses. So I think the top line message is to at least give something. Lower doses are better than no doses, but certainly whatever we can do to manage the patients to achieve the guideline recommended doses, that's the best care we can provide for our patients. I think uh, more recently, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, stability when we did guide it. One of the reasons that people didn't up titrate the drugs as they should, according to the protocol, was because the patients were stable. And I put stable now in quotes, because I think stability is merely an illusion. And when patients get switched over, say, to Losartan 50, everybody thinks that's fine. Losartan 50 is enough, and they never think of up titration. Catherine, do you see that at your institution, that the up titration just doesn't happen? Absolutely. And as you mentioned, you know, stability is an illusion, and not all drugs are created equally. We know that Losartan binds very, very weakly to the receptor when you compare it to a drug such as candesartan. So even the intricacies within switching between the drug class requires the monitoring and really requires a overall plan to get patients to that dose. And when we look at the blood pressure, um, we always take into account, especially in clinic, how the patient is feeling because otherwise it's just a number. And you don't want that number to prevent you as the clinician from up titrating if a patient is saying that they feel fine, that they're not dizzy, that they're not, you know, no episodes of orthostatic hypotension. So it's putting it all together to make sure right drug for the right patient and making the attempt to get them to the right dose. Yeah. So, you know, this issue of stability is, is really interesting because if you think about it, the, our entire medical practice is planned to prevent uh, adverse effects of chronic diseases. So how many of us will say that a blood pressure 160 in a patient, uh, LDL of, you know, 200 in a patient, uh, a hemoglobin A1C of 10 in a patient, let's leave the patient alone because the patient is stable and is not symptomatic. In fact, these diseases are by definition mostly asymptomatic. You know, you give aggressive therapy, you do lab testing, you bring them back to the clinic to prevent worsening of those particular diseases per se. But somehow we have partition, heart failure is a little bit of a separate entity where we just say that the patient does not have symptoms. First of all, this is a, a, a complete trap because the patients don't have symptoms because they have decreased expectations from their life. They're asking somebody else to help them. And we just don't have time in the clinical setting to be asking those questions. But we say, let's wait for people to get worse. The problem with this approach is twofold. One, a lot of the people are going to die of certain cardiac death before they get worse. So you lose that opportunity. And two, if they do get worse, their prognosis gets substantially worse. So yes, absolutely, if they get worse, we should apply to it. But wouldn't it be the right approach to actually treat them before they get worse so that they don't get to that point in the first place. I think your, your point is beautifully made. Uh, hypertension is the poster child of that. We treat a blood pressure because we know that strokes are high. We know that mortality is high. We know that coronary disease is high. 
And yet we don't do that with the heart failure. And I think a lot of it is fear. Yeah. You know, if I get a side effect, what am I going to do then? Am I going to get a phone call about the potassium elevation at nine o'clock at night? Now I've got to call the patient. What am I going to do? Sure. So Javed, review for us a little bit about the physiology of hyperkalemia, because everybody thinks it's the drugs, but there's some groups that are especially sensitive to rise in potassium. Yeah, so I mean, so can you eat a lot of potassium and uh, get hyperkalemic? The chances are very, very low if your renal function is normal because the body has homeostatic mechanism. The renal function gets rid of uh, uh, extra potassium and you're maintaining a very tight sort of a narrow range. So eating yourself into hyperkalemia in a normal physiologic state is not that, diff not that easy. However, the problem uh, with low potassium diet and why we uh, try to emphasize, also very, very difficult to follow, uh, is because there are certain high-risk groups uh, where the renal physiology is not normal. And that's where the combination of renal physiology as well as uh, uh, oral intake of potassium uh, leads to hyperkalemia. So what are these groups? Of course, renal physiology by itself, so chronic kidney disease, uh, there's a, a, almost a direct relationship. The lower the GFR, the higher the risk of uh, developing hyperkalemia. Uh, other diseases that affect uh, renal physiology, diabetes, uh, heart failure, again, higher risk for developing uh, hyperkalemia, and then is the issue of aging, right? So these comorbidities, uh, the chances increase as you age, uh, but also as we age, our GFR tends to go down. So all of these things sort of uh, work in, in concert. Uh, and then these things don't occur in isolation, right? So you have older people who have more comorbidities. So most of the people may have uh, two or three or four predisposing factors now. Here comes the most difficult part. And the most difficult part is that the way the renal physiology is altered by the use of RAS inhibitors and MRA that increases the risk of hyperkalemia. And guess what? Who are the patients who need RAS inhibitors and MRA? These are exactly the same group of patients that will benefit the most from these therapies are the ones that are at highest risk for developing uh, hyperkalemia. So now you really exaggerate the risk. You take a person who is predisposed to develop hyperkalemia, and then you give the drugs that can potentially aid in the development of hyperkalemia, and then with the combination, you see this high incidence. Some clinicians won't even start them if they see a potassium already that's borderline. I don't want to deal with this, so they never start the drug. The, the patients that particularly scare me are the diabetics. Yeah, but I mean, you know, from a clinician perspective, it's tough, right? So, I mean, we are, we, we're all told first do no harm. So, you know, right, right, sure, right. somebody's potassium is 4.5 and they don't start somebody on MRA, you know, it's difficult to, to understand. But if somebody's potassium is, say, 5, you know, it's not like it's 6, you could have started it. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, the patient does not have social support. They live two hours away. Maybe they cannot come back for labs. I mean, I can really understand why there is so much fear of starting these therapies. The problem problem is uh, that, that you avoid a short-term problem, but you walk into a long-term problem, and we don't necessarily realize that. And then when the patients get that sick, then it gets much, much harder to medicate. Yes, yes. Catherine, when you and I are working together, it's really important to bring in the team and to bring in the team early um, and tell the patients that this is not, these are not medications that you're going to be at the same dose forever we are going to up titrate, we're gonna down titrate. How do you approach the patients with that concept that the, the medications may be altered throughout their course? So um, I have these conversations when I talk about guidelines with patients because I think it really clicks to them when they understand what we as the clinician are trying to do and trying to achieve. Because if we don't make that connection, they're going to the pharmacy and they're spending another copay on a medication that they were just prescribed. But to say that our goal is to start you on a low dose, to see how you tolerate, to check in with you, make sure that you're starting to feel better. And gradually, you know, over two to four weeks, we're going to be doubling to go, you know, from say enalapril 5 to enalapril 20. You know, they look at the math and they say, okay, we're going to get from here to here. And we've got a couple steps in between. And that I think where the multidisciplinary team can really, really help with telephonic monitoring, checking in, um, and of course, bringing them back to clinic. And really now in 2020, I think our patients have this trifecta of the disease states that predispose, predispose them to hyperkalemia. How many patients do we see in our practice that 
are diabetic with stage two, three CKD and heart failure. And now that we have, you know, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors, the GLP1 uh, that are really just showing these incredible outcomes in patients with heart failure, sometimes even without diabetes, we're going to be growing our arsenal of tools that we have. And having the multidisciplinary team, having the pharmacists, the nurse practitioners, uh, the RNs to be able to really make sure that we can get patients the drugs and tell them about why we're using them, it helps. And I think it goes back to what Javed was saying, that by the time we're seeing them, they're already advanced. And then in the earlier stages, beautifully put, Javed, we weren't looking for that prevention of worsening rather than just you're stable and let's leave it there. So Javed, uh, you know, we lose some opportunities when the patients are in the hospital. To me, that's a terrific time to try the drugs because you're going to be able to measure their potassium you know, in-house and you get them on a, you know, a stable diet, but we're not doing that, you know, and it, I realize it's an older paper, but, uh, you know, the paper uh, from the Get With the Guidelines that Nancy published showing that the MRA eligible patients were not getting the treatment, even though it's very clearly in the guidelines. And I think we're so pressed to get the patients out of the hospital and lower the length of stay that sometimes one extra day may make a huge difference. What are your thoughts on, on the inpatient? Yeah, so again, I wanna sort of really highlight that the place to start these medications is in the outpatient setting to prevent hospitalization in the first place. But your point is really very well taken uh, for several reasons. One, uh, we need to really uh, realize uh, what, a, what a extraordinarily high risk these patients are at once they do get hospitalized and the trajectory uh, of the disease process has changed. So really try to optimize therapy in whichever way we can. So that's sort of one thing. The second issue is that in the outpatient setting, it's kind of a little bit tough because you may have a 15, 20 minute clinic slot in the hospital, the patients, even with the length of stay pressures that we all face, they are still gonna be in the hospital for three or four days. So you have a little bit more time. Their family members are around there. You may have a little bit of a larger team. Uh, you may or may not have you know, uh, other members of the uh, team, uh, nurses, pharmacists in the clinic setting, but you do have them in the inpatient setting. The family member is sitting there. So that's another reason uh, why we should emphasize. And also remember that they're a little bit now afraid that they've gotten sick. So you have sort of captured their, their attention. Uh, so it is no doubt that, uh, uh, no, no surprise that it's not only about heart failure, but for most chronic diseases, the, the data that we're looking at uh, is that medications that are started in the hospital setting. Remember, you don't have to up titrate to maximum doses. Let's at least initiate and give them a prescription that the medication started in a hospital uh, has the best chance of being uh, filled in the outpatient setting and be used in the long run. So completely I agree with you. That, remember, we learned that in the beta blocker era that yes. the patients weren't started. 60% of them may not be on them down, you know, six months down the pike. And I think the other important point here to make to our audience is that, yes, potassium doesn't get well regulated in the outpatient if you're not careful, that there should be some guides as to when you're going to check the potassium. But potassium is the number one reason why these drugs are often not, stop, not started. Nobody thinks of aldactone as lowering blood pressure, which it can, but it, they do think about it in the potassium sense. So in preparation for this uh, session that we're having, I went back and I started looking at withdrawal of ACE inhibitors and, and some of these things are actually buried in other trials. And I went, you're gonna laugh, I went all the way back to salt. And I found an abstract that uh, Dr. Constam had written because at some point in the SOLVE trial, the enalapril was withdrawn because the study ended. And then, you know, when they looked at the results, et cetera, they put a lot of the patients back on the drug. But the volumes started to increase at the withdrawal, which took me back to some captopril data showing that if you remove captopril, there's a sudden increase in angiotensin II because you really sort of unleashed whatever angiotensin I there was. And then in the more recent literature, we have a nice paper from Get With the Guidelines about initiation discontinuation and the small data from TRED now showing that the withdrawal of the agents, and Catherine and I have had these discussions before, clinically, it's tough. The patients don't do well when you pull the drugs away 
and now showing that the ventricles can get bad again and that outcomes are worse when you pull the drug. Uh, I'm sure you read that paper, but it was a very large number of patients, Javed. Yeah, so I mean, you know, if you think about, say, RAS inhibitors or MR. You know, what are the commonest reasons why people are not on these drugs or are down titrated, right? So it's blood pressure, it's a bump in the creatinine or hyperkalemia. These are the three common reasons. So I think we need to do whatever we can possibly do to avoid uh, taking the medications off uh, completely or uh, lower the doses. So we do this all the time, right? So if you think about blood pressure, we always say, well, don't take all the medications at the same time in the morning. Sort of space out the medication. Look at the list of the medications that may impact blood pressure, but are not absolutely necessary. You know, for bump in the creatinine, again, avoid uh, other nephrotoxic agents. You know, don't take non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Make sure that you don't get uh, hypovolemic. Uh, and same is true uh, for hyperkalemia. Do whatever you could to manage those potential problems, but don't reach out to stopping the drugs for the first time. Because what ends up happening is that, again, it's sort of a mindset issue here uh, that suppose if because of hyperkalemia, you take away somebody's MRA, uh, and then this, uh, this person comes three months down the road with worsening heart failure, uh, we are never going to say that hyperkalemia is the cause of worsening heart failure. We're going to say, well, this is the natural history of the disease. The answer is no. It was the hyperkalemia that led to discontinuation of MRA that led to worsening heart failure. So we have to try really hard not to do that, not to pull them off. Catherine, when you're having the conversation with patients, what do you tell them about potassium monitoring and how often do you recommend that they come in for, for their potassiums? And I'm sure that now we're going to have many more uh, lab draws in the home of patients who are not able to leave the home for whatever reason. Right. And it's always in regards to baseline, but if we have that borderline patient, the one that has the quote unquote allergy to the ACE inhibitors documented in the EMR because a couple years ago there was an episode of hyperkalemia. We usually tell patients that if we are starting RAS inhibition and they may be at risk for hyperkalemia, we're going to check with them, you know, minimum of a week. The guidelines really kind of vary on this of when they should be coming back, but at their convenience to get them back into clinic within a week so we can check the potassium. But this is also when we're starting to think about initiating a potassium binder in the future in case that lab comes back and now I'm in a situation of hyperkalemia and I don't want to withdraw my agent. I want to keep it on, I want to keep on the RAS inhibition, but I would rather than start to add the potassium binder to enable that. So I want to review for the audience now that you've talked about when the potassiums need to get monitored. The KDOKI guidelines clearly say that if the serum potassium at baseline is less than or equal to 4.5, then you don't need to do any intervention. If it's between 4.6 and 5, then you do dietary counseling. But it also says that dietary counseling and initiation of our potassium-lowering drugs including uh, if you're going to give an ARB or an ACE and the potassium is now 5.1, 5.5, and then moving on to starting the actual potassium lowering agent. So Javed, I've grown to calling this enabling the use of the life-saving drugs by using the potassium um, uh, lowering drugs that we have. And now we have two. Can you tell us a little bit about both of the drugs and where do we have the evidence for using them? Yeah, so I mean, you know, enabling, we, we do it all the time, right? I mean, we give antiemetic therapy for uh, cancer chemotherapy so that they can keep it down, right? So, I mean, that we, we, we do enabling all over the time. In fact, the other example that I just gave uh, that you, you know, uh, uh, cut down your diuretics and split your morning right. medications is, is basically enabling, right? I mean, it's the same concept. The problem with hyperkalemia was that uh, the previous uh, agents that we had, SPS, high risk for side effects, just not tolerated. So good for acute management, not for chronic management. Uh, but now we have two more uh, potassium binders, uh, pterimer and uh, sodium zirconium cyclosilicate. Uh, there's a lot of data that has come out over the past several years, multiple, multiple clinical trials and uh, registry observational study data as well. And what we have basically learned to summarize uh, with these uh, agents at A, uh, they are very effective. 
there is a dose response relationship. So the higher the dose you use, the more uh, benefit you see. Uh, that there is this fascinating sort of physiologic interaction between physiology and the use of these therapies that you kind of all, no matter where you started with, you kind of sort of land at the mid fours and the risk of developing hypokalemia and overshooting is very low. Remember these drugs work uh, in the GI tract and you basically, uh, this is colonic excretion of the potassium that you're ingesting. So your renal mechanism for guarding against hypokalemia is still uh, uh, intact. So, so what we learned from these clinical trials is that all of these high-risk subgroups that we are uh, interested in, if you look at the subgroup analysis, patients with diabetes or heart failure or, or aging or CKD, uh, ranges or baseline doses of uh, RAS inhibitor, low, high, medium. Uh, in all these cases, these binders were able to control hyperkalemia. Now, what I really like about these studies is that then some of the studies with both agents, now we have data all the way up to one year. And we are learning some fascinating things. One, overall in the, in the study, plus in these subgroups, you're sort of seeing a really well-maintained potassium, again, in sort of the mid four range, uh, all the way up to a year. Uh, and remember, these were free living people at that point. You know, you're out of the clinical trial setting. These are free living people. So hopefully they are following low potassium diet, but it's not easy, but they are sort of at home eating whatever they want. And their physicians are sort of changing medications and what else is happening. But despite of all of those background per uh, perturbances, you can see the potassium is ma uh, maintained very well. However, what is fascinating is that these were one year studies. And remember, although for one year, your potassium is maintained very well and these drugs are very well tolerated uh, overall, they don't have all the other issues of tolerance that we had with the, with the previous agents, uh, is that the phenotype that led you to develop hyperkalemia, that basic phenotype doesn't change. And you stop the drug after controlling potassium for one full year, you stop the drug, and a few days later, hyperkalemia comes back. Uh, so, so there are a couple of sort of uh, lessons uh, from this. One, uh, that this is a chronic issue, so the patients will need to be treated chronically in order to be able to optimize a RAS inhibitor therapy. That's one issue. But the second issue is uh, 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 you know, patient education, that they cannot just willy-nilly stop the drug uh, and continue to take their RAS inhibitor therapy. The last piece of clinical trials, more and more are coming out now, are actually prospective trials for enabling. There's one in uh, uh, resistant hypertension, there is one in heart failure, uh, where rather than treating hyperkalemia, you actually by design uh, up titrated MRA doses. And again, uh, you were able to up titrate MRA doses with the help of these binders in a higher proportion of patients and then maintain that uh, therapy as well. Uh, so we have data for treatment, we have data for enabling and we have data for long-term tolerability and efficacy. So we, you know, we've talked about the PEARL trial, which gave us, I, I think that's a great background to show that spironolactone could be increased as long as the patients were on pterimer. And I have found clinically, they usually land, you right, about 4.6. That's about the landing. Yeah. Um, and Catherine, have you noticed the same thing with uh, ZS9? Have you had an opportunity right now to to use CS9? Yeah, we have uh, both sodium zirconium cyclosilicate and pterimer on our formula. We're uh, having experience with both of these drugs. And again, patients are landing in the similar range and they tolerate the drugs well. From patients who have previously experienced k when it comes to the taste, they much, much prefer this. It's um, again, a liquid that they can drink that's tasteless, odorless, and to the point of adherence, once that point is made to them that they need to continue it because we need to keep them on the RAS inefficient, they understand. And a lot of times our patients who had previously kind of gone on and off the RAS inhibition, they've noticed, I mean, we've talked about the evidence behind it, but I call it the, you know, patient-based evidence, they know that they feel worse when we've stopped their drugs. So when they understand that we need to keep them on those drugs to keep them feeling good and that the potassium binder is enabling that, I think the issue of adherence is really understood from the patient perspective. You know, and, and at least with the pterimer, if somebody stops it, and we do have studies on that, you don't get rebound. Gradually, the potassium will come back up, but that question of rebound that we may be afraid of is just not there. Now, the final thing that we're missing, though, Javed, is I have often wondered 
if many of the benefits of some of these drugs is in fact that the potassium is elevated and that you have a diminution in sudden death. RALS showed a decrease in sudden death, which is something that ACE inhibitors have never shown. Um, so I think we need to show in a prospective way what happens to outcomes when you start the drugs and do it in a well-controlled, randomized fashion. So I know you and I are both very involved uh, in this study coming up, and you're one of the leaders. Can you share with us briefly what the DIAMOND study is? Yeah, so I mean, you know, the, this risk of sudden cardiac death and heart failure is, is, is real, and we don't talk about hypokalemia uh, as such, and hypokalemia uh, is also a big, big problem. Uh, if you look at the epidemiologic study, you know, we all worry about hyperkalemia at sort of, you know, 5.5 or something like that. Uh, the guidelines would suggest that over five, you ought to be uh, careful about these uh, drugs. Uh, but the epidemiologic data would suggest that actually the mortality risk starts going up uh, over mid, uh, mid four. Uh, so, so this issue, and then again, if you look at the potassium levels uh, in the uh, MRA trials, uh, RALS or Ephesus, uh, clearly uh, those patients uh, who are hyperkalemic uh, have a higher risk. Uh, but the absolute risk is still gets lowered with the use of MRA. So you're better off still using MRA if any uh, way, shape, or form that you can. But nevertheless, there is a lot of appetite to see uh, not only enablement of these therapies, but whether or not that will lead to improvement in clinical outcomes. Uh, and there is an outcome study ongoing right now, uh, uh, running into a little bit of a, a, a slow uh, a, a ongoing with this whole COVID crisis that we're dealing with. But nevertheless, the DIAMOND trial is looking at the pterimorb guided uh, optimization of RAS inhibitor therapy versus placebo on long-term clinical outcomes. So um, I'm going to start closing, but I think some final thoughts that we want to share is that this is not an easy journey and that you just can't, you know, shoot from the hip and say, oh, the potassium is how I'm going to stop the drugs because there's consequences to suddenly withdrawing the drugs and that you really need a team to do this. One clinician alone can really not handle this. And it has to be a team effort because the patients take their cues from different team members. And I, you know, I have always found Catherine, of course, great communicator with the patients, that they feel that they can call her back and, and ask her questions that they may not necessarily ask me. But I think now we have some drugs that will help us get the right patients on the right drugs and we still need some answers. We need some answers on the outcomes. Uh, but I can tell you personally that the patients, if they adhere to the drugs and they adhere to the potassium binder, they will remain stable. And that that stability, as Dr. Butler well put it, can last a year, a very stable. We don't see that other than maybe in the hypertension trial where we saw blood pressure controlled for a year. And what were we trying to do there? Well, we were trying to avoid the consequences, 50% of which was heart failure, as a matter of fact, and stroke. And so that thinking about prevention of worsening is equally important to just prevention of a side effect. And, and we need to start thinking about that. We haven't done that enough. I'd like to thank my faculty for joining me in this terrific discussion. I think we've gone through a lot of important points. And then finally, I wanna thank the audience for participating in this activity. Please continue on to answer the questions that will follow and complete the evaluation. When you do the evaluation, we'd love to hear from you about future programs that you would like to see and maybe how these programs are actually helping you in your practice. And with that, I sign off. Ileana Pina wishing you all a great day.